Yeah. Um, what, uh, what, what I'd like to, to do is to, um, uh, this, this talk, this is only the second time I ever talked about talking to It's a long time I uh, uh, avoided talking about them at all. Uh, because there seems to be a very large industry of people who are already very well informed about the problem. It's been that uh, it's been pertinent to that. Uh, but the, the issue that began to interest me a lot was uh, because working on this material on geometry that I have in the past couple of years or so, uh, I've, I finally had to kind of take up the, uh, the modular and read it, which I never had done. I was thinking of an incredibly boring book, uh, having, it, having it thrust on me uh, when I first came to study architecture. Uh, I'm told it was the answer to everything. Um, and fin finally found that it was uh, not all that boring. There, were, there are boring patches to the modular, uh, but there's also some very interesting ones there. But it's a very curious book because, uh, because of, well, I mean, if, if nothing else, because of when it's published. If you think of uh, our general picture of uh, local Bouzier's career, uh, starting off in the teens and twenties, uh, working up to something in the teens, uh, getting his, uh, his architectural sensibility together in the twenties, making all those wonderful pillars and so forth within the context of uh, the international style, functionalism, rationality, all those kinds of things, and then moving off of that over the period of the 30s and the 40s uh, until you end up in the 50s uh, with the culmination of his work in some senses, or some say the, the, the absolute denial of his earlier work uh, in buildings such as uh, Termini and Ranchon and so forth. Um, <coughs> which seem to be in a different kind of universe altogether. Now, uh, it, um, it is interesting then that the modular, which is a thing which in many, in many respects harks back to that earlier idea of, uh, of an underlying, informing rationality to architecture, uh, should have been conceived so late and actually written uh, and um, um, pursued so late in Corbusier's career. So what, I, uh, what I'd like to do basically this morning is, is, is nothing but uh, take up, just, just describe some of the characteristics of the modular itself, which are perhaps not quite so uh, obvious uh, at first sight, uh, and then uh, try and relate that to what Corbusier was actually doing in those buildings of the uh, mid-50s. Uh, a particular Ranchon, because it's, uh, uh, it's a particularly good example of something else. Uh, and in doing that, I'd like to uh, suggest that there, there w it would be impossible to, to, to find an informing motive in Corbusier's work, which would account for everything. So what we can do is we can, we can locate several which seem to be of peculiar importance, uh, but they don't appear, I mean, as, as things presented as, as principles in themselves, at all compatible. Uh, um, we'll come back to that maybe later. <coughs> um, just in, in the very early part of uh, Corbusier's career with the, the publication of L'Esprit Nouveau, uh, with Ozenfant and the purist movement and so forth, uh, in the uh, early 20s, you find Corbusier making some very, very didactic, very, very clear statements about the use of order and geometry in the architect's work. Uh, in the three reminders to architects, he says, I mean, you'll, you'll probably know these, you'll be very familiar with them, but I'll read them out anyway. Uh, Working by calculation, engineers employ geometrical forms, satisfying our eyes by their geometry and our understanding by their mathematics. Their work is on the direct line of good art. And I says just a little later, it says, architects today are afraid of the geometrical constituents of surfaces. The great problems of modern construction must have a geometrical solution. Um, this is a preliminary to a section in which he, in uh, the, uh, towards a new architecture, uh, in which he talks about the engineer's aesthetic, claiming that although architecture should be the most remarkable of all the arts, it's actually in, a, in the doldrums, and that engineers' work is much more uh, the vehicle for aesthetic properties than architecture. 
at this particular moment in time in the 1920s, and the reason for that uh, is that they understand this geometrical armature, uh, this productive geometry, and how to use it in the making of objects, whereas architects have forgotten this. So that's all fairly clear, and then there are you know, these uh, references to well-known sets of, uh, of geometrical forms like uh, the Philippine solids, actually, they're not Philippine solids, but they're close enough uh, in the same book. So one's in, left in no two minds about uh, what at least the elements in the constitution of this rational, functional architecture will be. Uh, and one's left in no two minds either about the fact that if, if engineers are already using it, that's validation enough of the fact that it's functional. But Corbusier always wants much more than that from it. This is merely a starting point, his functionality. <coughs> now, uh, as opposed to that, there is a period in the 30s uh, when Corbusier starts to toy with other things. Uh, there is a very fine article by, uh, well, two articles, one by Mary McLeod and one by uh, Sanislas von Moose uh, in an article of opposition which deals with uh, the theme issue on Corbusier a few years ago. Uh, uh, both of them are talking about that period in 1930-1931 when Corbusier was invited to Algiers uh, to do the, the project for the city uh, and produce various uh, uh, urban urbanistic solutions for, for that uh, for that city. Uh, and the story goes that he was uh, he was being shown around the city first off by um, a civil servant, French civil servant employed in Algiers. Uh, and they went and looked at this, and they went and looked at that, and they went and looked at so uh, But this fellow wanted to show Corbusier uh, all the sites of, of Algiers, and so they ended up in the four quarters and uh, around the bottles and so forth. Uh, and Corbusier, I can't remember the details of the exact, exact details of the story, but he ended up uh, in this room with this woman uh, who offered her services, and uh, he, he drew her. He, he just drew her on the back of a completely happy paper. Uh, this, this is a kind of illicit event, because Corbusier is, is, is a man who doesn't sort of relate to these kinds of things very easily. So it's kind of a, a, an undertow in his work that uh, he's doing this kind of thing and then he is sketching this woman. Uh, and uh, th it's this, says Mary McLeod, uh, that uh, really uh, leads us into the incredible curvatures that he's doing very soon after on the Otis Project for that same city. Uh, her story is much better than the way I've told it, and much more convincing. Uh, and it's really a very nice story, and I wouldn't for the, for the world want to do away with it in any way. It seems to me that this kind of story about the other side of Corbusier's sensibility, fed from somewhere else, perhaps sources which might not be uh, either uh, transmissible because they're just not the right kind of sources to be transmitted, or literally not to be understood by the by him himself, who kind of deeply embedded in conflict. Um, so what we're presented with, I think, is two quite different pictures of Le Corbusier, which are essentially historical. That is that uh, until relatively recently, certainly way after the Second World War, uh, the conventional historian critic's picture of Corbusier was as an apostle of rationality and um, of uh, 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 a kind of rationality which would lead to beauty of its own account, taking that aspect of his work out. Since then, what's happened is a, is a very considerable reaction uh, where that side of his work is discounted or even got out of the way altogether as more or less irrelevant. And what we concentrate on now is Corbusier's creative intelligence, this aspect of him which is much harder to kind of locate and rationalize, but which produced these fantastic inventions in terms of architecture. Uh, and it's this, uh, this again that I'd like to ad address here, because it seems to me that, uh, not this particular story, which I, I think is quite wonderful, but that overwhelming drift of the critical enterprise towards that idea that what we're looking at is a Corbusier who's 
ideas are somehow the product of genius, first of all, but there's more to it as well. These, these, these products of genius are also embedded in a personal or cultural history. And then it's our job as historians, critics, or as, as creators to, as it were, reproduce this whole business ourselves in a similar way, dredging the unconscious. <coughs> Uh, now, if you look at Sir Corbusier's painting, uh, it's certainly true that there is, in the 1930s, a strong uh, shift away from the um, more rigorously rectilinear structures of his earlier paintings, and you get these very kind of bodily forms uh, coming into uh, much greater prominence there. This is a thing called the Green Athlete, done in 1938. Uh, but it also is probably worth pointing out the incredibly obvious fact the, the thing is, apart from the fact that, that like all paintings, it's a certain rectangular frame, most of them, uh, that it's, it also reinforces that within the kind of the painting itself by uh, this, this sort of strange uh, structure which somehow gets between that, uh, that edge and this uh, otherwise constituted <coughs> body in the, in, the, in the middle of the picture there. Uh, so there's those two things are operative within the, within the painting. Uh, now, I'd like to, uh, at this point, introduce the, the, what goes on with the modular, and just talk about that for a while, because um, as, as a, an individual episode, it's probably easier to just simply isolate it. So. Um, you'll probably all be familiar with this, which is uh, a postcard, uh, which Le Corbusier um, inscribed with these lines in, in the Frenchies. Um, and it's in towards a new architecture, but he uses it again in the modular uh, in order to point out something which, uh, which struck him so forcibly uh, in, I think, 1918 when he was fiddling around with these postcards on the table. They were just sort of distributed idly on the, on the tabletop. And uh, what Paul Buzier noticed was that the edge of one of these postcards overlaid on this thing uh, just happened to, to sit like that. Uh, and it seemed to suggest some incredible correspondence on the facade of this building, the Capitol in Rome, like Michelangelo, uh, between the proportions of, of that and the proportions of that section there, because this was a right angle in between here, and therefore, because that's a right angle, these are similar triangles, and then the proportion of that is going to be the same as the proportion of that. He doesn't say anything about the, the, uh, this, this uh, concatenation of proportionalities that would arise from that. He just notices the fact that that right angle hits at this crucial point, and that therefore this is a matter of incredible interest to him. The prominence of the right angle in architecture. Now, you see, if you, if you say that, so it works, the prominence of the right angle in architecture, it, it makes us uh, tap them out for a ridiculous truism. I mean, obviously, you don't have to put these on here. You know that there's all sorts of right angles in architecture because that's the way we make them. So what appears to be an incre incredibly naive, stupid comment on the part of Corbusier is in fact something else, because what he's pointing out is another constitution of triangles which is completely invisible within that um, facade of that uh, And it's this other rectangularity that is completely inexplicit in the building, which he's interested in, not the one that you can see. And, and he's Perhaps that, that's just too obvious to mention. But the fact is that there's, there's a double constitution of rectangularity in, in this thing. Uh, a, a hidden one and an explicit one. Uh, this is uh, the, the, the beginnings of the whole quest for the modular, incidentally. This, uh, this prominence of a hidden right angle. It's that that he's, uh, he's struck by. And he comes back to it again and again in his description of... Uh, of uh, the way in which the modular was invented, which he gives a, a fairly long account of in the uh, first book of the modular. Uh, you can see that he's using these kind of relationships in the organization of facades, such as the Garsh uh, facade there, uh, where there is this very, very 
Well, that's, again, that's nothing really interesting in that. Uh, now, these regulated mines, it's well known that, uh, that Corbusier was, uh, was very much influenced by uh, earlier French academic writers, uh, although he always maintained a complete indifference uh, to what was happening in schools. Uh, he was, was nevertheless, in some ways, uh, a, a product of the academic reason, reasoning of the, of the earlier generation. Uh, this idea of regulating lines is certainly one, one such instance. Uh, but I, I think it's, uh, what's, what's striking about the way that Corbusier uses it is, is, is that it's never a complete principle. And again, I'd like to come back to this next week uh, when we talk about uh, earlier ideas of, of proportion and the way they work in architecture. Uh, so that there is a, if there is any potential difficulty uh, of wrapping yourself up in these things as a sort of form of protection and justification. Uh, and certainly there, is, there are elements of that in Corbusier, the way he's always trying to justify what he does now. Uh, but much less so in the work than in the statements. Now this is the, uh, the, the first, not it isn't the first, but it's, it's one of the earliest, uh, more or less complete drawings uh, showing the modular system and the story in 1945. The modular was published in 1951, the first part, I think the second part was 55, something like that. Uh, so uh, Corbusier was completely preoccupied with this thing for a very long time, from about 1943 uh, to the mid-50s somehow, uh, covering that whole period of this productivity, including the, the buildings that we're going to be looking at later. Mm -hmm. And uh, let me just try and explain, it would be easier on the blackboard, but as uh, that facility isn't available, uh, I'll try and do it on here. Um, what happened was this, that uh, Corbusier decided, more or less without any very, very clear idea, that he wanted some schema of measure, he wanted some system of measure. It wasn't going to be the meter system, which he described as a, as a mere, what was it, a mere number of meter. What he meant by that is a but he certainly didn't think much of it. Uh, he thought the foot was better, the English foot, the imperial foot, because the foot related to the human body, whereas the meter was just an entirely abstract conception to do with uh, a fraction of the, of the circumference of the earth. Uh, so the foot was much better, but the foot was really kind of, uh, it was terribly difficult to use in cumbersome, so that wasn't much good either. In the earlier phases of the model, what uh, Corbusier seems to be suggesting it's never quite explicit about it, but it's, 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 it's definitely what's implied, uh, is that the modular is going to overtake both these systems of measure in everything. It's going to be a kind of universal system of measure which will apply to everything, mechanics, architecture, this, that, and the other. And it will, it will uh, supplant both of these systems. Later on, he, he, he retracts that and says, well, no, it's just for the production of refined measure that's for creators people who actually build things will use the old system. So we have to translate from the modular back to these old systems. But essentially, what we had in mind originally was something much more ambitious indeed, a completely illusion of uh, Western ideas of, uh, of, uh, of measurement, uh, using this as the underlying system. <coughs> uh, and there were two things that he wanted to do with it, which again, he was very clear about at the start. One was that it, was ha it had to be related to, to well, it's very difficult to say re related to the human form. We get this idea of, you know, hands and feet and the measure of being related to human scale. Uh, but the way he talks about it, it's much more corporeal even than that. It's fleshly measure. So there's a word that he uses. Um, in order to get this thing really corporeal, really about things, but not about abstractions. That's very important as well. Now, the way he, he uh, goes about uh, searching for this thing is he sets one of his assistants, an ankle hand, uh, on the trail. So if you're, if this is during the occupation of France. Go away and think about this for a while. So he got the hand and goes away and thinks about it and produces this thing. And I've been talking about this, this thing about the, the diagram of the year. So he comes with this little diagram and sends it to Corbusier by post. Uh, they then correspond, and this thing builds up. And then there's another person called Mademoiselle Maillard, who was, I think, a mathematician, uh, who started to help on this business as well. Uh, so they're all kind of involved 
stayed in the system forever, uh, was this. He said, first thing you do is you draw a, a square, which is actually this square here. This is not so easy to talk about this one, actually. Uh, because the, the major line isn't in there. This is, this is the first square, okay? In there like that. Now, the first thing you do is divide that square in half, vertically like that. That line isn't in there, but it would be down there like so. Uh, then, what you do is you take the diagonal from that midpoint there up to there, and then you rotate that down like that to get that point there. And then, still in that original square, you take the diagonal of the whole square and lay it down the other side like that to get that point on the baseline. And lo and behold, says Corbusier, what you get is two squares, this one and that one. They don't meet in the middle. The middle, as you've seen, is somewhere over here. The middle is the original square. They're sort of shift over uh, to the left-hand side. But uh, essentially, you get two squares. Well, that was quite magical, but then the even more magical part of it was that when you put you did your little number with the, uh, with, with the postcard. Uh, lo and behold, uh, on this line here, the join of those two engendered squares from this original one, well, there's a right angle at the corner there. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? And this thing goes right through there, and then down there through to the last one there. Yeah, uh, in the middle of that, that square there. He can't, otherwise they'd overlap. He hasn't taken the middle of the, the, the middle square, you said there's a missing line down the middle. Yeah, but which would, which would if be there. If it rotated that, each Well, he didn't rotate that line, he rotated the diagonal oh. from, the, from the half square, oh. like that. In other words, from there to there. Oh. And then on this side, rotated down that. To get that. Oh, right. right. <laughs> <laughs> he said it was, yeah. Uh, it relates to it somehow. Actually, it's not. And the, the, the incredibly interesting thing here, again, this is not in order to kind of um, denigrate the system. What's much more important is the way in which Corbusier actually set the thing up, which was that uh, it was essentially this business of fiddling around on drawing boards, canning these kind of things, you know, putting one thing over another, and getting a construction where you've got visible correspondences between things. That was the point. Uh, this, you can see here, is, is what uh, allegedly is the, uh, the system that belongs with this, uh, which is that of, of the, uh, the Golden Section, or the, uh, uh, the Fibonacci series. Uh, and again, it will be much easier if I had a blackboard. Maybe we'll do this this afternoon if anybody's interested in the um, uh, seminar. Um, so th there's, there's a, a system which is to do with numerical proportionality, a system which is entirely to do with a, 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 an idea about multiplication or addition of <coughs> elements to get a series. That's the Fibonacci series. Uh, and there's the, the geometric construction, which was the underlying genesis of this thing. In fact, the idea that you could have a series which would relate to this thing only came on rather late in, 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 in the generation of the thing after a year or so, and after Corbusier had gone to uh, a professor of, uh, of, of uh, natural sciences, not so long, I forget where it was, and this man had said to him, by locating the right angle in the two squares, you have produced the system of which just proliferates golden rectangles. And it was that little thought that sparked off the idea that the whole system was to do with it. Um, this other idea, which of course had been going around for ages. The idea that the golden section was a, was a, was a key to beauty was a, an idea which was very strong in the 19th century. <coughs> so, that's basically the kind of thing that he was uh, talking about. I'm just sitting on the side of uh, And even in the late 50s, he was still going on doing, uh, early 50s and late 50s, still doing uh, diagrams which used the same basic system. Here you can see both the, uh, the elements of this uh, rectangle in place here. Um, so that uh, this is the original rectangle. So the original
Now, it was only in 1948 uh, that uh, another mathematician, a uh, very well-known mathematician called René Platon, uh, pointed out to Corbusier, who had gone and seen him with this new system, uh, that the thing didn't work, that it was wrong. Uh, but even despite that, Corbusier shows absolutely nothing about these relations. And, he, and at the end of the, the first module, it says, this minor, this minor distinction between a math the mathematical purity of this thing and what we see in this construction uh, is, was for him a kind of indicator of life itself, because it kind of was an asymmetry between the two, so they kind of argue around, which is okay anyway. Um, but the point to me is, is, is rather this, that what he's starting to do is he's, he's completely involved in the idea of the production of visual relationships. So he starts off with, with a geometrical diagram, something you draw on a drawing board. Later that gets transferred into something else, which is to do with a system of numbers. Uh, and because, the, in fact, the, the, what all the problems are about, it might, it might occur to you that uh, this right angle, I, I won't go through why, but it's fairly, it's fairly clear that that can only exist in the middle of two squares. That's the only point that's going to touch the top of that uh, top bar there. That's the place. That's the top. Uh, it will only be in the very middle of those two squares and not slightly um, asymmetrically on the original divide line of the original square. So the whole thing was that that's where the right angle should have been, not there. Uh, and although he could have easily have just fiddled the thing around and put it there, he never did. It was always, it was always kept there. Uh, there being some six thousandths difference between the actual length of this required and the double square that he'd uh, 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 the purity of, of his idea of the system. Right. <coughs> so that was the system. Uh, and you can, uh, the other thing was that uh, about halfway through this whole process, again in the, the, the late 40s, uh, it was suggested to him by Joseph Salton, that, who was one of his assistants, uh, that really this had nothing to do with a system of kind of making squares and triangles on paper. It was a system of linear measure. Uh, and it was at that point that Salton devised this <laughs> little golden uh, section strip or which he rolled up into a little kind of tape measure thing and put into a uh, film case, carried around with him everywhere, sort of measuring things to see if they actually corresponded to the golden rectangle and lo and behold, most of them, by some miracle, actually did. And so there's in the book on the modular, there's all these accounts of things like the ships that he had to be traveling on and how this, all, all the, uh, the rooms of this ship, you know, they're, they're, they're all golden rectangles and they're absolutely beautiful. Uh, so the whole thing takes on a, a, that kind of flavor of, uh, of being a, a kind of self-justification after a while. <coughs> How, of course, it's very like what we expect our text to dream up, these kind of systems of measure. It's sort of within the tradition of the, of the, of the trade, really. Um, here's a painting done in 1922, which is reproduced several times uh, in the context of the module, uh, which Corbusier uh, says is guided. It was this painting, in fact, he said, which was the beginning of the whole business as far as artistic practice was concerned. Um, because uh, if you look at the basic organization, not only are these uh, figures geometrically organized, think back again to that picture of the uh, capital in Rome, but the organization of the canvas itself, the underlying is also there. And that, uh, so this is halfway through, this is at the halfway line. Uh, there's another halfway line which is actually about there, according to uh, the diagram, uh, and which uh, locates various things in that way. But the most important thing of all is a double, is that old rectangle with the, and the triangle again, which hits sort of somewhere there and, and somewhere here, right there. And he's very, he said very seriously puts this forward as, as the underlying structure of the thing. And there's nothing to say that it isn't. That is, he could quite easily have started off drawing that on the canvas and then working from that out towards the, 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 the actual thing. Quite possible. Very likely. But the important thing, again, is that it's, it's, it's 
almost, almost invisible. And certainly the, this idea of the rectangles and the triangles are, are, are invisible. <coughs> now, there have been studies, this is one by uh, Larry Mitney, uh, which was published a few years ago, uh, on Corbusier's painting and his architecture, which, uh, well, I think it's part of the same business I was talking about in relation to uh, this general drift of Corbusier studies, that uh, the tendency is now to, to concentrate on the creativity of the genius and the sources of that creativity rather than on the rationality of the, of the thing itself uh, as a reaction against this absurd, overweening, rationalizing history that was produced before. Uh, and if, uh, like one of the things that uh, Mitnick does is he takes that very same painting here uh, and notices that the, the forms here are similar to the kind of forms that Corbusier was using 30 years later in his buildings, like the uh, Chamigan um, Hall of Justice here. Uh, and that's perfectly reasonable. I mean, he goes through all the different ways in which these formal uh, likenesses become apparent. And that helps us to construe the idea in our minds that Corbusier is an artist. He says that's what he is anyway. And that the genesis of his work as an architect comes from that source, which is, a, which is in some ways a very gratifying idea to us at the moment. <coughs> but if you look at the buildings, uh, one can certainly see that in them. There's no doubt that that is, that is part of, of what they are, and that they can be accounted for to some extent that way. Uh, but I don't think that one can, it, it's not an exhaustive account any more than the rational. Uh, let's, let's just move across now to the issue of, uh, of this building. Now this is, this is a building that started in 1950. It started a year before the publication of Modular 1. So it's been working on the Modular for six years. This is a major building. Uh, we'll see that the Modular is in mode. But how can you get from a system of measure like the modular to a building like this? This is the problem. Because they really are not easily compatible, are they? Now, the, uh, uh, the accounts that are given of the way in which Corbusier invented this, this, this building, uh, of the way in which he did it, uh, there's uh, there's a, a now a, a, a kind of um, uh, a quite well established and uh, quite well accredited uh, way of, of, of doing that. Um, Corbusier himself left quite a few notes about this building and what he was uh, um, trying to do with it. Uh, certainly suggested that uh, it, the, the process of creation was extremely sudden. That is that. It was like a flash of insight. Uh, and in fact, it was in relation not to this church, but to Fermini, that he came up with a quote which is, which is very frequently reiterated by critics, which is, uh, I should quote you in talk, I'll, 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 I'll try and paraphrase, uh, which is that uh, essentially the act of creation, having an I idea about architecture, uh, is something which is basically a spontaneous event. It's not spontaneous in the fact that it just happens out of nowhere. It's spontaneous in the sense that you, as a conscious manipulator, as an artist, architect, have no real control over it. And he said what he likes to do uh, is, when he's given a commission, is that he just, he doesn't do anything. He doesn't draw. He just likes to think about it for a month or two, that's all. So he just sort of stores it in the back of his mind. He doesn't kind of think about it consciously either, but just lets it, as, as he puts it, simmer there, fester. Uh, in fact, the word he uses, similar to the word he uses, uh, in order for this thing to, as it were, kind of build up in the back of the mind, uh, which will suddenly, like some kind of vomitory process at the end, produce this, this idea which comes on with the suddenness of a, of, a, of, a, of a thunderbolt, and out there it is. And he says, finally, the way to actually instigate this is, is to pick up 
And he says that's what happens here. That's, that seems to be what happens here. He goes to the site, he visits the site, he looks around, he wanders around, he, he goes away, doesn't do anything for a while, and then something on the back of the envelope does these sketches. And there, right away, in 1950, is the organizational format for the church. It stays like that forever after. So there's a, there's a lot to be said for this kind of idea of architectural creation, obviously. And the man has said it himself, after all, and he should know. Um, now, that's one side of it, which I think is, 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 is the undeniable side, or rather, it would be difficult to deny. Uh, there's another side of it, which is what historians and critics now make of that, which is really rather curious, because what happens now is that we know that that's how he comes to produce these things. We will accept that. So what, what business, of, well, what can we do? What we can do is we look back uh, what happened to the man beforehand? What went into this kind of festering pit of the brain uh, in order to produce these ideas? So it becomes a kind of historical, psychological thing about divining where these things come from. So what we have then, I mean, when we come to uh, this, there's a very good introduction to the collection of drawings of Marshall by a man called Paul. Uh, who has done this, who has gone through and say, well, yes, of course, we know that the thing has something to do with a shell, because he's, uh, that's what Corbusier said. He found this shell on, on Long Beach Island, and that was what originally uh, sponsored the idea, which was to lead to this roof here. Uh, he trod on the shell by accident, and it didn't crack. He picks it up, sees that it has two layers to it, and that's, that's what gives it its strength. Uh, and so this then becomes crab shell, uh, the, the logic of this thing here. So that's one of the kind of ingredients which is sort of there simmering in the mind. Uh, now, there's others too. So it, it, when uh, Le Corbusier was traveling over Algiers, he went across this place which he fell in love with called Nazar in an, aer an airplane. And he went and visited afterwards. And there are these, these buildings in the Mazar, and oh my goodness me, they're all painted like, all done in this kind of texture. And they have these sort of strange forms to them. And so Paulie reproduces these things, and you say, yes, well, it's really true, it looks incredibly like it. Another thing is a dam that, uh, which uh, Corbusier had sketched, which looks very, very similar to the actual um, forms of, 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 uh, of these plants of the building here. Uh, very much sort of kind of apex in that kind of way, two curves. So all these kind of ingredients can be kind of uh, um, dredged from Corbusier's past by the historic account of what um, struck his consciousness uh, in order to account for this thing. Now, it does seem to me that those, again, are, are, they're, they're very legitimate and there's nothing that one can say against them uh, at all. And they're very interesting. Um, but do they give a whole account of the building? Aren't we in a very, very strange situation where we see, on the one hand, this man doing this thing about the modular, which seems to have no immediate applicability to this object. Uh, on the other hand, there's all this psychological account, all these things under the, under the table, which suddenly come out in these uh, 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 final architectural presentiments. And uh, how either of those two things end up producing a building is anyone's business, or what they actually do to the forms. Could you, could you derive the forms from, from those previous ideas? I, I, I find it very difficult to imagine how you do uh, particularly because of the, the issue of the size of the building, the scale, that we're talking about all sorts of transposition, from the crab shell to this thing. It could have been anything, some buildings in the bazaar, a dam. And um, that brings us back to this issue of the presence of, uh, of uh, other kinds of geometry in this building. Now, I just want to make the thing even more complicated at this point by saying that it would be impossible to imagine this building built without geometry. Not necessarily the modular or anything like that, but just some constructional geometry. There are buildings or constructions like, uh, like this one, the Watts Towers, which are done without but they're really very, very few and far between. Most buildings which we like to think of as free form in the 20th century, Gaudi, uh, Mendelssohn's uh, Potsdam Tower, uh, the 
Opera House in Sydney and Corbusier's later buildings are actually mediated by some other way of making the thing. They have to be, because they start off as drawings and they have to be transmitted from that form into another form that turns up as a three-dimensional building. They have to be commensurable between being thought and being built. So there's another kind of ingredient here which is completely absent from all these accounts. <coughs> And if you look at the plan, you can see damn well that uh, clearly by the time the thing is, is, is being, the first sketch is dark charcoal. And it's about these, he identifies these four horizons on the top of the hill. There are four horizons, he says. Think back to this thing about the right angle. And uh, so there are four walls. And it's a bit like the right angle. It's like all buildings have four walls. You can't expect much to come out of that. But his four walls aren't really quite like uh, the normal four walls of a building. So consequently, they respond to these horizons. This one facing over here, great seas. Um, this is south, this is the north. Uh, so one, two, three, four walls, four bits of walls somehow make this thing. It's a response to the sun. It's a response to what he calls the acoustics of the side. So from his point of view, the thing is working from outside in. He's seeing this horizon. The building is, as it were, kind of touched by the horizon and produces this kind of acoustic resonance with, with its, uh, its landscape, its landscape it's in. Uh, and uh, so that's how his, his, his um, reminds it. Now it's quite easy to see that uh, you could, well particularly on the floor, uh, set out this thing and, and analyze it in terms of the modular. And indeed, uh, these floor measures are, are compatible with the modular system. Uh, it's equally easy to see that if you took the walls themselves, that would be rather harder. Because anything that curves can't, is, that is not a Euclidean surface can't be made into these rectangles that are usually used as proportionality. In other words, you can't see the proportionality that way. When you get a horizontal and vertical dimension and you say that is in the ratio of 2 to 1, you can kind of see it. But as soon as you start altering the, the that the, the surface on which these things sit, that's not going to be the same at all. It just can't. Uh, and I just use this as, a, as an illustration of, the same, of exactly the same thing, uh, which I always like to use as uh, an example, which is from the matter with Geiger, uh, book published in 1939, uh, where he's producing something which is, uh, it might even have been quite influential on Corbusier in the generation of the modular system, uh, which is this um, double square um, analysis of the, the, the face of Helen Wills, showing that the golden rectangle is predominant within that schema, and that the ratio of 1.61, whatever it is, to, to 1, is the golden section, uh, is, is uh, the, the, the guiding force of this thing. It doesn't take much to work out, but it's only because it's a photograph that we can do that. Just as you can do, always do it on architectural drawing because it's a flat surface, you can always do it on a photograph because it's a flat surface. You can't do it on the actual page because you don't know where you're measuring from too. If you're measuring that way, that way, well, it really depends entirely on, on which angle you're looking at the person, whether you regard their nose as actually measurable that way or that way, their mouth as, as, as deriving from them. It's, it's, there are so many things which are just completely untouchable like this thing. Uh, so that this Vizio-like arrangement seems to be entirely divorced from what it pur purports to, to justify. Now, of course, in something like uh, uh, Corbusier's building, the system is working the other way around. He starts off with this idea about proportionality and then ends up with a building which is vastly different from what you'd expect the thing to produce. Uh, this is probably a bit of a diversion, but uh, it was also during the same period that he started uh, yet again to talk about the, uh, the right angle and wrote this thing called the poem of the, of the right angle, uh, which was uh, uh, some odd notes appended to some uh, prints that he published in 1955. Uh, and uh, like this thing here, this sort of strange political sentiment about the left and right and the left uh, uh, synthesis, Things 
you can see here, well, look, you, that, that line, that's, this is the kind of thing he's talking about in these, uh, in these prints that, that accompany these poems, these little poems. And it's all to do with this, this again, the right angle which is never apparent, and which is illustrated as a kind of a propensity towards a right angle rather than an actual thing. I mean, you know, this line and these lines are sort of, and sort of rectangular in the relationship, but not actually that one. Uh, this is the nearest it comes to something which is just an explicit statement of it, and then it is just an explicit statement of the idea. Uh, and the next nearest is this one, where you get something of this kind, these <coughs> figures of women, which are very kind of... Uh, uh, calligraphic and, and irregular, uh, and, and clearly intuitive forms. Uh, under this, this underlying cross-like structure, which seems to uh, sort of just sort of divide the thing rather arbitrarily to me. Uh, so again, we have this strange, ambiguous presence of, of the two things. Now, given this uh, this rehearsal yet again of the of the incredible power of the right angle, isn't it interesting that when you look at the at the, at the building, uh, not only there there are not all that many apparent, are they? But where they are is, is, uh, is well, I mean, here we are, here's the, uh, the, the altar table, the doors, the other little windows, there are little windows around this uh, epiphany of the Virgin here, and uh, they're, they're rectangular. Uh, these small windows here, uh, this little, I'm not sure what this is, pulpit like phenomenon, stuck on the wall, uh, and the small windows here are, are more rectangular. As things get smaller, as they get more to the scale of something kind of normally used by human beings for furniture or for handling one way or another, they become more like rectangles. As the thing gets bigger, it loses that characteristic. Now that's amazing, because it's amazing because it's a complete inversion of the normal practice in relation to architectural structure and decoration, but you could look back any distance in time. That is, Greek architecture, Egyptian architecture, whatever you like. The structure is more likely to be more or less rectilinear in form, and the decorative things are likely to be the things which lose that structure. Now this is turning that white right uh, head over heels, so that the small little things, the things that are actually uh, a, a, a modest presence within that, become the things which, which, which revert to rectilinearity, but the overall, overall form doesn't appear to have it. <coughs> Even the floor, we were looking before to, to see the, the evidence of, of, uh, of the, um, the modulus presence, uh, is in fact a slightly curved surface. And uh, of course, a floor slightly curved gives the impression of being quite amazingly non euclidean I mean, you're very, very conscious of the fact that this thing is sliding off uh, from the uh, main doorway. Uh, this whale like belly of the Roof is, is another thing yet again. Now, I mean, just in, in pursuit of this idea of, of negation and inversion, it was it, it was <laughs> it was exactly this period again that Corbusier, after having ignored it for thirty years, started to uh, talk about the idea of space in the twenties when other people were doing it a lot. He didn't have a set of words out at all. Uh, in the fifties, he starts talking about it, space, the ineffable space created by architecture. Nice book, like the one that people. Um, another thing called ineffable space, uh, which treated this subject very specifically. Now, um, the curious thing about this building, we're thinking about this acoustics of the landscape and how these walls are, as it were, made by the landscape. The very, very strange effect of the interior is this thing of, of uh, it's, it's like the opposite of the way that everybody had normally construed architectural space the normative construction of architectural space, and the only time that, that he says anything about it in the twenties, that uh, is to confirm this, is as a bubble-like internal thing, which is giving form to the building from inside, that you are making architectural enclosures, and these enclosures, in his examples of the Byzantine buildings, are, as it were, kind of pushing the building into shape from the interior, giving it its form from that way around. Look, look what's happening here, exactly the opposite. The thing is being pushed in from outside. 
giving this kind of exhaled vacuum like property on the interior, as if everything was being kind of sucked out through these windows and uh, evacuating it as um, that uh, characteristic architectural concept of bubble like internal formation. Uh, also, the wall, there was a, a scheme of the modular organization of that wall where it makes a certain amount of sense, as you can see. And indeed, the, the wall looks a little like one of the diagrams that he has in uh, the modular book, uh, showing various rectangles of various proportions in relation to one another, but not quite. But the real presence of it is as a. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's that he illustrates it on the door. And the door's a tiny little thing in this thing, but uh, the golden rectangle comes from the regular pentagon and joining up the, uh, the diagonals of a regular pentagon produces this uh, uh, golden rectangle by the tunnel. Again, I, I, if anybody's interested, uh, I'll, I'll show you how that happens in the, uh, in the seminar. Uh, but these things become like illustrations of its presence, as do these things here. But everything else is kind of shifting off and leaving. And look how the same thing happens between registration of color and outline. It's all the same kind of thing of establishing something and then moving off from it. Very, very peculiar. Now, let's just come back to, I'm not sure what the time is. Uh, let's just come back for a minute to this other thing which you said was left out. We've got these two very anomalous uh, ideas now. One, here's a man involved in the mathematization of architecture. He invents this system in a rather peculiar way. And it's sort of present in that building. Yeah, and it's there. It certainly doesn't account for it. It doesn't make a building. But then we have this other account of creation, which is about all these kind of ideas which come kind of spilling forth in this moment of... Uh, of uh, Blind intelligence, something. Uh, uh, about the origins of those and various things that the man had seen before. Now, I'd like to add a third ingredient to that, which I think actually helps uh, helps get the form of the thing into some kind of um, uh, uh, um, characteristic arrangement, um, which is this thing of how you actually make a building of that time. Uh, we're talking about originary ideas so far. What about how did they make the, the thing? What was it? Now, if you look at this thing here, the South Tower, this is a really interesting drawing. It was done, uh, one of quite a few, but this is the most explicit, uh, of, of how that was made. Well, you can see it's, uh, this is the, the section of that tower here, there, the light comes through the uh, And here it is. Uh, an elevation of that kind of bull nose of it. Uh, and here is a plan. Now, this is what happens. You start off with a very, very straightforward, compass and straight edge version of the, the outline in the section. Then you start fiddling about with various cut lines along this, giving each one a definition of its own here. Each one of these. Oh, sorry, it's not that way, it's this one. It's uh, which are defined by these various radii, which are eccentric and dislocated, as you can see, uh, in order to produce this little, this little sh sheet of flatness at the top there, um, and produce these various, more or less, but ge geometrically determined, but not quite so coherently, uh, arcs and straight lines. Uh, but then what you end up with as a, as a third term is a continuous surface. Uh, which you can't draw with uh, compasses or straight edge. And it's these things which then give the, it's those which become the really powerful properties of that object. Now there's no doubt at all that Corbusier had already decided that he wanted things of this sort. But the question I'd like to ask is simply this. Uh, given the fact that they have to be made through some kind of procedure, um, does that procedure actually give a constitution to the objects it makes? Is it, is it just a way of making the forms, just the way he thought about them? I can't really believe that it was. It seems to be much more likely that it's 
it's helping make the form than the procedure itself, uh, as one would expect procedures to do. Um, so that, that uh, that's that's one thing. The other thing is is <laughs> is that it's one of the relatively few times in which uh, a genuine en engineering kind of drawing is used in architecture. Because normally you don't need it, but here in this building you do. Of all buildings, this one, which is the most existential, tragic, artistic, all these things where you expect to be reading the engineering bit right behind, that's where you really need it. That's the interior of that uh, same town. Uh, and that original, I mean, I should stop here, okay, and maybe we'll finish this off next week. But what, uh, what I'd like to um, just point out as a, as a codex, finally, uh, is, is that this technique of drawing had been architectural, and uh, architects have pretty well relinquished it, given it up, in, a, in the early part of the 19th century, and it had gone, it had been sort of transferred over to engineering at that point. Now, uh, there's a very interesting thing that happens between this, this kind of drawing, zipping over to engineering at that period of time, constituting a class of objects which have nothing to do with what architects do, and then architects coming along about a century later, looking at these wonderful things and saying, these are absolutely extraordinary, we must make things like this too, but not doing it the same way. So it's that that I'd like to come back to next week. How this strange metaphorical use of uh, the mechanical uh, is, is in, induced in, in 20th century architecture. Uh, for those, who, for the people who I'm seeing uh, after two o'clock, there's a, there's a list already. Uh, I'll be down in the general studies area, so that's, that's where I'll be. Uh, one of those offices there. Um, well, I think it's going to have to be next week. The, the lecture next week is uh, is is cancelled. So. The next one will be the week after next, and I'll do, everything's just sort of shifted across one week, I'm afraid. <coughs> um, what, uh, what, well, this is a bit of a leftover, this one, because it, it um, it's, it's really the tail end of, of what we started off with last week. Um, what I left you with last week was, I, th I think we were talking about the third slide in this sequence here, which you've just seen, uh, talking about Corbusier and his modular and his buildings, particularly Ranchon, I mean, that's what I've been concentrating on. Um, uh, because of the perplexing absence of applicability of that system to that building, and we saw ways in which it was there, uh, as a kind of almost, almost as a kind of um, representation of its own presence, as in the uh, diagrams on the door and so forth, uh, but much less obviously so within the context of the building itself as a piece of architecture. Um, and I also showed th this drawing as an example <laughs> of uh, something which was of immense interest to me because it showed another kind of uh, geometry, completely and presence of, of number, if you like, uh, completely different to that uh, which was postulated in the modular itself, operating very differently, uh, but embedded in the in the building in a completely different way as well. And the modular is supposed to be fundamental. This is what Corbusier is always telling us about it. Uh, this seems to be merely some kind of production process en route between the idea and the object. Uh, and I was expressing some um, um, misgivings as to whether we could actually describe it like that in this way of simply being uh, some, uh, a way of getting a concept into a thing. Uh, simply that is a kind of neutral thing, which was not really having much influence or <coughs> effect on what it was transporting, uh, this idea of the building. 
<coughs> and we also kind of talked a lot about the, uh, the, the way in which Corbusier criticism fixes on uh, the idea of poetic creation in Corbusier, particularly during these, these later years. <coughs> uh, and a, that in comparison to this also is interesting because it suggests that however poetic the origin of the, uh, the idea may be, that there's other things coming into play in between times, uh, which are of a, again, a different order. So, but uh, we, we haven't really exhausted uh, much of this, uh, this question. I'm going to turn the lights down, which I've forgotten to do, which are here. Um, the first thing I'd like to do is, is just say a few words of, of there's something even more strange about the deployment of that particular kind of technique in that particular sort of building. Um, in order to make that apparent, I'd like to give a, a very, very quick and very rough summary of uh, uh, what it entailed and where it came from. Well, it's engineering drawing of, of, of a time, really. Uh, now, the, the, uh, the, the, the history of, of engineering drawing is very closely linked to the history of architectural drawing. At least we can say that from the 15th century up until the 19th. Uh, during that period, most of the foundations that were being laid for the development of engineering drawing as a what's called descriptive geometry, uh, most of the materials that were being laid down as, as the sort of basis for, for the development of descriptive geometry uh, were tied very, very closely to, to architecture. Uh, and particularly to the art of stone cutting, stereotomy. Um, this is a, a fairly typical early 18th century uh, stereotomic diagram uh, which shows uh, how to derive the, the, the true angles and the true lengths of the pieces of stone that you, you would need to make a, an assembly such as this in each cut in a digital surface. Uh, it's not a particularly complex uh, proposition in terms of the actual forms, uh, but you can see that the, 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 the drawing needed to produce this uh, becomes, uh, um, well, two things. First, it might have a, an aesthetic of its own, which is, which is uh, neither here nor there at the moment. Uh, but also, it's not of the thing it represents in the usual way one, one would expect an architectural drawing to be. That is, that, uh, the qualities of the, the drawing are not illustrative. It's, it's a procedure which is being invoked, so it doesn't matter if you can't see what's happening up here. In fact, the way of drawing, which is to lay one kind of drawing on top of another, uh, is, is, uh, is downright, um, uh, it makes it downright difficult to do that, because one's actually looking at about four or five drawings laid on top of one another, uh, for a different cuts through that uh, particular formation. Now, uh, this, is a, this is from the 1950s. I mean, this, is the, uh, this is what's happened in engineering drawing. Uh, the story is this. That was a stereotomic diagram, the kind of thing that had been rehearsed dozens of times between the 16th and the mid-18th century. Towards the end of the 18th century, uh, an engineer-mathematician called Gaspar Monge in, uh, in Paris, a uh, friend of Napoleon, so the Acropole Technique, um, generalized uh, descriptive, what he called descriptive geometry, which was taken specifically from all these stereotonic te texts. That's where he got the basis of that uh, generalized and very elegant uh, set of ideas. Monge was right at the root of, of the development of engineering drawing. He saw that as his ambition, really. He wanted to get all this material uh, taught at the Ecole, which he did, uh, and then sort of transported out from there into the factories and the arsenals and all the places where things were actually being made. Uh, this also is, is very clear. <coughs> uh, and uh, so uh, the peculiar thing is that although the first thing that Monge himself taught uh, descriptive geometry in was stone cutting, he gave a course in it at the Ecole for the um, it didn't really take long for there to be an incredible division. Architecture, at precisely the moment that this other kind of drawing, more generalized, uh, was, was invented by Monge, pretty well within 10 or 20 years, architecture had dissociated itself from that practice. 
and went on with a much more kind of straightforward illustrative idea of the use of parallel projection for facades and plans. <coughs> now, uh, that is, is terribly interesting because what it means is that in, in, in some ways, architecture divorces it, itself from this system. It then travels somewhere else. It is in the factories and the arsenals and those kind of places, but it does have its, its, uh, its, its, its raison d'etre, but uh, it's, it's used very much in the fabrication of, uh, of machinery of one sort or another. <coughs> now, this is Russian, incidentally. The only place where this is taken seriously anymore as pure geometry is in, is in Russia. Uh, everybody in the West thinks the whole subject has been exhausted, but, uh, which it might well have been. Uh, but they still uh, try and improve on Monge's methods. This is very simple to Monge. Mm -hmm. It's very similar to Monge. <coughs> now, um, you're all familiar with what, uh, what goes on in the early 20th century in relation to engineering. I, again, I'm going to mention this last week in relation to Corbusier. Uh, that at the beginning of uh, Towards a New Architecture, there's a section called uh, The Engineer's Aesthetic. And here, Corbusier, the architect, looks towards these other things, these things which are now adventitious. They're outside of the context of architecture. Uh, and it, it's with the eyes of, of uh, the architect uh, who sees architecture in a parlous state, a difficult condition, rather degenerate, who looks across and sees what engineers are doing and says, look at these wonderful things produced by the precisions of geometry, etc., etc. Now, he doesn't use this geometry in, his, in that early work at all. I mean, there's no hint of it in any of the villas or any of those major works from the 20s or 30s. It's in the 50s when everybody says that this is what he's given up, that it travels back, creeps back into the work, in that drawing that we've just seen, that technique for trying to make a relatively incommensurable kind of form and, and make it travel through drawings into an actual building. So there's the, uh, the interesting thing. But if we look at, uh, so this is an illustration taken from uh, L'Esprit Nouveau, uh, the, the magazine that Corbusier edited in the 20s. <coughs> uh, and it shows some of these things that are produced with this technique, right? I mean, these are parts of uh, this is exactly the kind of thing that's interesting. And of course, they're different kinds of forms uh, to those normally associated with, with the rationality of functionalism, aren't they? And this is the interesting thing. See? Now, um, you can look elsewhere, because uh, I think that it's not only Corbusier who is touched and affected by this, this strange kind of division and re looping back into. into uh, art and architecture. Because you take something like Duchamp, and uh, this thing is obviously a joke. We know it's a urinal turned on its side. Well, that's pretty funny. Uh, and exhibits the thing by signing the name of the manufacturer on the side. Our uh, nut, which is nut. Uh, so uh, it, it's, it's very amusing. But the, the, the reason that it's amusing is because it is actually quite attractive. Uh, now, again, that kind of attractiveness is de derived from exactly those same circumstances. That's the way that those kinds of things are produced. They're drawn, the forms are made, and the things are produced in the forms through that medium of drawing. Descriptive geometry lies behind the, the, uh, the uh, non-rectilinear forms of these, uh, these kinds of uh, household items. Uh, not only that, but uh, Duchamp was, was very interested in projection. Is the, the technique itself of getting uh, images into flat surfaces, three dimensional things into two dimensional things, uh, and practice the thing in different ways in uh, both the chocolate grinder series and in the, the large glass. And this is a drawing that we did, uh, I think, originally for chocolate grinder. Sure. <coughs> uh, likewise, the, the <laughs> this is this is the machine aesthetic. This is a Noguchi sculpture from the 30s, 1938. It's called thousand horsepower heart uh, and it deals again I mean, if you think of the, the paintings that uh, Corbusier is doing at this period so the mid 30s period uh, they also are, are involving this this uh, uh, more voluptuous development of forms which is normally seen in sexual terms uh, but this kind of organic mechanical thing can, can flow either way you know, can, can operate either way Uh, now, there are, there, I mean, in a way, this is just simply piling on the, uh, the, the uh, 
observations of the same sort uh, about uh, Corbusier's work during that period in the 20s. Uh, this very famous illustration from George's New Architecture uh, with a chapter heading Automobiles above the, the Parthenon suggests that. But what I'd like to do now is suggest there are three ways in which, in which this idea of the mechanical and rational manifests itself, itself in terms of forms. There are three ways we can do it. Uh, it's probably just worthwhile distinguishing those. Uh, the first, uh, which is very apparent towards the new architecture, is I suppose the most obvious one, which is this, the idea that functional things are basic. The forms that they, uh, they obtain are the easiest, and that therefore office furniture and uh, you know, file systems like this and so forth uh, will be kind of more or less rectilinear, box-like forms. This is, this is one connection between this whole idea, this, this uh, fundamental informing idea of the presence of geometry. It can manifest itself like that. Simple enough, and very obvious. Uh, in exactly the same, and if you look, I mean, there is a very interesting thing here about the way that Corbusier takes, uh, for example, automobiles and aircraft. If you look at the, the illustrations that he has in, in that, uh, in, towards in your architecture. Uh, there are, as Paul Shepard uh, points out, they're, they're like coaches, they're not like cars. Um, even the, even the aeroplanes are like that. Because uh, <laughs> they've been subjected to this kind of, of fabrication procedure. Those things are very kind of square and box-like here, early revisions of them. At the same time, there's things like this, uh, which would suggest, going back to the other old idea about the, uh, the, the platonic solids, uh, that another way in which the precisions of engineering <coughs> manifest themselves are to do with these, the five even solids, spherical, cylindrical, uh, plane surfaces, cubic forms, and so forth, and they're piling up rather than their intersection. That is, a, you know, there's a cubic form and a cylindrical form, and there's, uh, there's a, part spherical form or something like that. Uh, one on top of the other, as you see in uh, this kind of thing here. Uh, and the third is the sort of thing that we've been looking at, and this is another illustration from Corbusier, and here we still see, you know, it's still going on, this great hymn to the joys of geometry, it's still being perpetrated in the, in the text. Uh, things like this, which are the kind of things that now I'm saying uh, relate to this other practice. So there's at least three ways in which we can understand uh, the presence of this underlying geometry and the interest, the particular interest, of uh, machinery and equipment and how it's manifested in that stuff. <coughs> uh, and these are other, I mean, this is another one also from, this has just been published now in an English translation, which is uh, a book made up of articles in L'Esprit Nouveau uh, called The Decorative Art of Our Times. Sorry, The Decorative Art of Today. Uh, and here you see, I mean, this is this, this sort of bit that now looks across. Uh, interesting kind of relation. But this is very early on, and we don't find things uh, of, of the forms of this, of this species in Corbusier's architecture of that time. Uh, so in one way, it would be, it's very easy to uh, make connections, I'm sorry, you can't see this thing, can't you? but it's a drawing done in 1920. Uh, and not a particularly characteristic drawing, because I'm usually precise. Most of Corbusier's drawings of his paintings, even at this stage, are relatively kind of sketchy, and then the precision is brought in later. Uh, but this one is drawn as a kind of precise thing and left in that state. Uh, where we can see intimations of all three of these things, if we care to look close enough. But which one we choose is, is, is uh, entirely kind of personal matter. <coughs> At the same time, uh, coming back to the later works, and uh, Ranchon in particular, if you remember last week, we were talking about what Daniel Pauli had said about the, uh, having found these drawings in the Corbusier ar archive, which suggested that uh, Corbusier had made sketches of the dam, and that this, the sketches of the dam suggested some of the, uh, the qualities of the, of, of the, the forms of the exterior of the, the Ranchon building. 
Uh, and indeed, that is, is simply the, the, uh, the other way of looking at it. This isn't the same dam. This is a uh, dam in Montana, uh, in the United States. Uh, but it shows similar kinds of characteristics, both the, in the elephantine quality of the thing itself uh, and in the, uh, the particular formation of roof in relation to uh, that of wall surfaces. Um, that, be that as, as it may, the, the point I'm trying to make is, is simply this, that um, while the ambiguity is very, very strong in that early period, we can't tell whether what Corbusier really meant what he really had in mind for his architecture was the, the, the idea of functionality associated with piling boxes or with fuselages or something in between. It seems to be more piling box-like in many ways as an actual set of, of architectural objects. Uh, in the later period, it's possible to see that other intimation of these engineering forms <laughs> pushing back into architecture that had the most peculiar back route because on the one hand, the thing that Corbusier is presenting himself as having relinquished is all that kind of business of, of modernity in today. Well, at least as far as he talks about his own creative poetic process. Um, most, again, most critics and commentators have tended to follow him, not unreasonably in that, um, interpretation of his own work. At the same time, if you look at, at, again in those later works, not only is there the modular, which is one form of kind of ordering system, which is sort of <laughs> trying to insert itself back into this. You, you also have the observation of these practices. You also have, in the, in the text that he writes, uh, continuing reaffirmations of all those old ideas about geometry, order, and so on and so forth. So it's not quite so uh, unambiguous, that, that later period at all. Uh, and it's easier to link it back, in some ways, with uh, real engineering procedures and practices than it is the earlier. <coughs> uh, I come now, I want to come now <coughs> to the, the, the roof. Again, something I mentioned last week was the incident on uh, Long Island where he found a crab shell, and the crab shell was the image for the uh, invention of the, uh, the, the roof of the uh, branch on uh, And he has a full photograph of the crab shell and the figure of the and various other publications on Long Island. That produced, uh, and he keeps it in his collection. Uh, these these are early uh, versions of very very early sketches in 1950 uh, of that roof form, uh, and the, the double skin idea, which is what he takes structurally from the crab shell, which is a structural idea rather than anything else, uh, is, is fairly apparent there. Um, now this is quite an interesting drawing, it's done in 1951, and the building is 50 to 55, it's concentrated in 55. Um, what you see here is what's happened to the developed thing. Now, do you, if, can you remember, I'm sure you can remember from the photographs, what that roof is like to look at? Does it look to you, when you look at this here, which are pretty well the forms that they finally did use, I mean it's a bit more of a crank in some of them, uh, in the later designs, but basically it's essentially the same kind of, uh, of uh, formation. Uh, would you think that from that you'd get a, an effect like you do from the underside of that, that roof? Because it doesn't seem to me that that's clear at all. Um, what one has instead, I think, is, is, is something very clear uh, with relation to aircraft wings, and that's also been brought in the bottom explaining what the structural principle behind this thing is. Uh, and indeed, that, that is what they look like. But that's not all. Uh, you see these lines across here on this thing. These, these are to do with that roof system. Now, these are incredibly important uh, to uh, this next set of observations that I'm going to make about something else yet again, some other, some other system of measure, which is deeply implicated in this building to make it what it is. Uh, perhaps even more notably so, and more prominently so, than, the, uh, uh, than that formation of the tower tops and those other uh, incommensurable bits uh, of, of the, the building fabric. Um, so anyway, we have this, what looks like a, a slightly canted grid. It's not quite 90 degrees between these coordinates and those. Um, 
but really these uh, these are the section lines uh, which are for these rib white formations here uh, and this here which is the, is the key of the, the whole thing uh, is the way in which Corbusier understands that roof to be made now think of those little sketches right like the, the belly of a whale or something like that. I think this is a, a, it's, it's very suggestive of something of that kind, very organic. Um, and look what's happened to it here. This is what it ends up as. You'd never guess it, I don't think. There are little bits added to, to make curvatures where he wants them to come particularly prominent. But the basic schema is actually this. Now this is really interesting because what he's doing here, all he's doing is he's saying there is a, there is a, a, a particular... Uh, sectional line here, which is made up of complex curves. Who knows? I'm not quite sure how that's done. Uh, and this one happens to be a straight line at the at the uh, the east end here of the of the building. Uh, and then by simply dividing these things equally from orthographic projection, not equally on that line, but equally along that line and equally along that line, conceived orthographically. That's why these things are all parallel. Uh, and then joining those lines together from that line to that line, you get a surface. Well, it's, it's simple. Uh, and he calls it a conoid. He says in this, you can't see it here, but he calls it a conoid uh, in that. Um, <coughs> which, is, which it isn't, but it doesn't matter because it's a kind of, it's a kind of quasi-geometrical way of building up a surface now. Uh, so. No, this is going back to those old things. I mean, we've already gone through this, so no problem. It's just that he was very conscious of that kind of formation uh, of airplane wings. This is from a very interesting book that he did in 1935 on aircraft, which is published in England. <coughs> and it's just photographs of airplanes. One thing to notice here, incidentally, is the way the photograph is taken. I'll come back to this towards the end. Uh, this is a particular kind of photography which Corbusier is very, very prone to. He really likes these radically cropped pictures of things which are so arranged that you can't immediately see what the subject of the, of the, of, of the photograph is. You can see the form and the texture before you can see the subject matter. Now in most photographs you're, uh, you're aware of the subject matter first and the form later. But in these, it's, it's the just by the way, when the photographs are taken, a quite well-known technique already for birdies. Uh, <coughs> one gets this, this, this other transformation of the object, which is also quite interesting. Uh, that's from the same book, and one might add that to these kind of this increasingly long, kind of almost indefinitely long list of potential likenesses that you could uh, connect to the building. Oh, actually, one other thing about that, which I quite like is this. Actually, I should have mentioned this already. Um, <coughs> you notice this, it says, and Neptune rises from the sea, crowned with strange garlands, the weapons of Mars. Well, that's a nice little poetic number, isn't it? I mean, this is the thing that we, we're, we're quite familiar with, this idea, that you take something which is actually quite uh, ordinary in, or in relation to present circumstances, doesn't appear at all poetic, and then we write a little poetic line about it. I've forgotten what the actual rhetorical term is for that. Uh, there is one. Uh, and it's turning littler things or more prosaic things into more poetic ones, kind of elevating them. Um, now, you see, the interesting thing here is what Corbusier has been doing with this stuff is the reverse. Now, if, if you think of uh, this in terms of, of Ranchamp again, at Ranchamp, he's using the actual procedures uh, and the poetry is working the opposite way. It's making something which is like a machine uh, look like, first off, something quite different, and something which is, is sort of just replete with all these apparently poetic associations. But as you look into it, it's more machine-like. And indeed, th this is the strange thing about modernity, is that its attitude to the machine, because it's representational, is using the machine as a metaphor. It's not using machinery to make poetic me metaphors, the machinery is the metaphor, it's the subject of the metaphor. Uh, and this is something that happens quite a few times with modern architecture. The, 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 the strange consequences, to, to my mind, is that 
uh, modern architecture is more metaphorical than any other that there's ever been because it takes the things that are normally construed as being functional and construes them metaphorically. I've seen that happening with engineering drawing in that, uh, those earlier versions, and it happens also with a number of other scientific ideas that uh, Corbusier works with, uh, as well as many other modern artists. <coughs> oh, this is the fatuous connection between me. But I think which is interesting because, again, the, su suggest the suggestiveness is, is brought out simply by the, the odd circumstance of the photograph. So what is uh, behind it and what's in front of it is very difficult to tell. That is, we're, we're just construing that likeness because of the accident of the, uh, of the photographers seeing the likeness and just uh, capturing it for us. But it's not something that Corbusier needs to have thought about before he did it. That's why it's so interesting that it has that, that uh, power of creating associations almost anywhere, whether prior, by prior arrangement or not, whether by intention or not. Now, I want to come back now to this uh, business of these, the, the, the kind of roof form that, that was uh, being made in, in Ronchamp there by those straight lines uh, between two other lines. Um, Imagining something else in passing. This, as you know, is a, is a section of the uh, church at Fermi, uh, which is a slightly later building. Uh, the Ranchon was finished in 1955. I don't think this was even started until 1960. It was probably the last uh, major building enterprise that Corbusier undertook. Uh, and it's still being built now. Um, these are drawings that were done in 62, uh, and they show. Uh, Something which I, I think is, is again really rather uh, indicative on a number of levels. Firstly, they're very, very stupid looking drawings. I think we ought to acknowledge the fact that by comparison with what we would understand as an architectural drawing, these things look just dumb as hell. They really do look at it. Who would get away with putting on a rectangular base like that, this thing coming down like that? There's no kind of idea of support or of continuity or anything. It's just uh, one thing on top of some quite, apparently quite straightforwardly organized uh, functional uh, arrangement of plan and section in the lower parts there. Uh, and indeed, that is the impression you get from the drawing. The drawing, nevertheless, is a, is a very accurate one. It accurately describes a section through that building. And we'll see why that turns out that way. Whoops. This is a model that uh, was done in the office, again, in 1961 or two, it's not sure, wire and, uh, and string model. Uh, and you can see here that he's doing exactly the same thing that he did with the roof at, at uh, Robert uh, That he's taking this square plan base here uh, and making this strange, strange form uh, by simply dividing up the base and then taking the lines up and uh, dividing up this, uh, I'm not sure if this is an ellipse or an oval, it doesn't really matter, dividing that up and then connecting the strings to the correlative points on here. Uh, and what you get? Well, you get this strange sort of pseudo-conical form. It's not a conic form, it's not a hyperboloid parabola. Par um, a hyperbolic paraboloid shell, which is what Corbusier said it was, again, it's like a colonoid, it's not the bright, it doesn't matter. In fact, what he does with it is immensely interesting. Um, because in this, he can't, it, it, here, it looks as if something's gone wrong, because when you, when you get this side, uh, the subdivisions here, uh, because they've all been exhausted, if you think of the way in which, well, uh, I, I would guess that he started off with this side here, because you get that number of divisions, and then you get, by the same technique as at Ronchamp, that number of divisions around the, the, the half of that curve. You join them all together, and you get a series of, of lines which aren't parallel to one another. They only look parallel in an orthographic projection, like that, making that curve out of straight lines. But when you get here, you get this little knot problem. That is, all these from down this side all converge on that point. Uh, now, I think that was probably seen as a, as a difficulty to start off with, but what Corbusier, or I'm not sure it was Corbusier 
or Jose Ubrelli, who was the uh, job architect for the scheme, has taken it on ever since. But somewhere in that intervening period, as when Corbusier, well, just before Corbusier died, or just after this, they decided what they were going to do is join all these lines up in triangular sets on each of the surfaces there, which produces completely flat surfaces, completely triangular flat surfaces around there, and then curves which kind of get between them. It's a much simpler kind of organization. And you can see from the final model uh, how, that, uh, how that works. And it gives the thing a fantastic kind of uh, curious ambiguity about whether it is uh, a flat or, or curved surface, because it contains elements of both, you see. It's there. <coughs> so what we see him doing in all these projects is, is, is using these um, uh, surfaces generated from straight lines uh, to make curvatures. Well, they're kind of quite well known. Here's a sort of 19th century uh, descriptive geometry, well, descriptive geometry, uh, illustrating how you can do those kind of things following the rules described by Gaspar Monge in descriptive geometry. And, and so. uh, but perhaps the most interesting things about these are the way they came about in the first place, uh, which is that so that the the, the the first version of, of this thing is the hyperbola of, of revolution, which is this thing here. Uh, and it's, it's Christopher Wren, it's another architect, who invents this technique of generating the form. The form was known before, but it's the way of making it out of a straight line, which was so interesting to him. Not only that, this is only 1667, uh, the, the way in which he found that out was tremendously interesting. Uh, and very unlike most geometric uh, um, inventions of this kind. Uh, the story is that he goes into a, a, a shop to buy a basket, and he sees the basket makers working on these things. They have circular bases, and they put all the cane work at uh, regular intervals out of this thing. Now, that's all, would, if they're all sticking up straight, obviously made them come. But what had happened, because these things are not that rigid, is that they'd kind of fallen over slightly. Uh, and each one had pushed the other around, and um, lo and behold, what's the, the shape you get? It's this one. So he could see from this that these, these straight lines just falling over at an angle in relation to the generator of the whole thing, the axis of the, uh, of the, the system, uh, produced this, this incredible bowed curved surface that worked out being a mathematician, <coughs> but it was uh, uh, a hyperbola in, uh, in section. Uh, and then started to do all sorts of things trying to use it. That doesn't really concern us. But the, the point uh, here is that the thing is, is, is kind of, there's this visible relation between straight lines and the thing which they make, which has no apparent straight lines in it. And if you think about what we were talking about last week in relation to this strange double idea of the right angle that Corbusier also has during all these years, it's obvious that buildings are rectangular, so why write hymns about the right angle and poems to it? Well, the reason is because he's talking about hidden rectangles that are also in those buildings. The angles to things, triangles that have right angles between them, uh, which get proportional relation between parts. That's why he was interested, this hidden rectangularity. Uh, and the, the hidden straight line, and this I'm sure is, is a similar kind of thing. He was absolutely fascinated with getting geometry into things in such a way that it was no longer visible, that you couldn't see it. Not that you could, but you couldn't. That was the thing that was so fascinating, it seems. Wherever you look, he's doing the same thing. This is at uh, Hyderabad in the Milanus Association building, the meeting room in there. Similar kind of form. Uh, similar, uh, the interesting thing is that except in the next instance, he never uses the pure form. He realizes that you can make any line and any other line and just join any number of straight lines between them and you'll get a continuous surface of some sort so long as the two lines are continuous. Now that's much more interesting than fixating on the idea that it must be a rectangle and it must be uh, a conic section that one's dealing with, which most geometers do. That's how they deal with those kinds of surfaces. But that's not what Corbusier is interested in. So he gets these open curves like this and works in the same sort of way. Fine. It's very interesting practice indeed. <coughs> uh, and this is the one where he does use a, uh, um, the most straightforward form, uh, very similar to the one as described by 
Christopher Wren, uh, which is at uh, the <coughs> assembly building at Chandigarh. A uh, final example is another, it was just 958. Again, we're talking in this last 10 years of his life, this period, basically, this one and stuff. Uh, and we still see him going back to ideas where he's making things look much more kind of mechanical and machiney and m modern uh, than in the cases of the chapels that we've been looking at, or of Shandigar. Uh, such, for example, as the Phillips Pavilion, the Brussels Exposition, uh, here. But you can see these things are generated in the same way. You can also see that the, 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 this is a little, this is a little pamphlet that Corbusier uh, published on the building. Uh, you look at that last photograph, which is down in the slide library there, and indeed others are the same, but that's, that's, not the, that's not the most obvious one. But most of the, those kind of photographs are the things in situ which try and show the whole building. The first thing you become aware of with is how dinky the thing is. Uh, these photographs show it as absolutely gigantic, this kind of vast desert-like surface just spreading away to infinity or uh, So by kind of closing the photograph down, and again he does this for the photographers at Rochon, people who have photographs that use for that same kind of business. Um, there's a very interesting thing that uh, at some point one feels that this building was not that brilliant because really it, it expressed its opinion as well as it obviously. Whereas at something like Ranchon, what's happened is that quality of, of making the thing look rather different to, than the way you'd imagine it to look, given its constitution, and given its actual size, works much more brilliantly. It's like the same thing. You take, a, you take something, and you've been looking at photographs for years. We know that for at least 30 years he'd been involved, no, more than that, he'd been involved in this sort of propping exercise of cutting things down, as it was the, the sort of relatively abstract piece. And when he finally gets to the point of making buildings that have that property in themselves, you can see what a wonderful transformation it is. You get these little lies in photography and you end up with something which is not like that at all. Uh, here's another, I mean, this is just an instance in, in point, another of those uh, illustrations from the aircraft book of 1935. That's a crop figure. And that's the generators and di directors, as he calls them, of the... Um, the Brussels Pavilion made in exactly the same way. That's the plan of it. And the other thing I'd like to point out here is, is just the thing about Corbusier in relation to drawings. We've seen that with the section of Fermi, for example, that you wouldn't get through first year on a drawing like that. But that's because it's... it's <laughs> that's because he's not... The drawing is really just a, a, a recognition of the fact. Actually, the magic of the drawing is that you don't realize, until you take a section like that through that building, how incredibly straightforward it is, because it doesn't look it. The thing doesn't look like it. He's made it in such a way that nevertheless has that uh, idiotically simple armature structure to it, in section, uh, uh, right lines of section, at least. Um, likewise, if you look at a drawing like this, there was obviously not a great deal of effort put in by Zanarchis, who was the person involved in the <coughs> Brussels Pavilion most uh, closely, and, and Corbusier, uh, into the drawings themselves. I couldn't care less about them, really. Uh, but there is uh, this very interesting little quotation. That's again from Ranchamp. And given that Corbusier, amongst all the architects of the modern movement, uh, is, uh, appears to spend no time on drawings. Now, if you look at Mies van der Rohe, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, even, even Gropius is more interested in drawings than... Corbusier seems to be, as drawings, as sort of things to look nice. Now listen to this, he says, um, he's talking about uh, this little book that he's doing for Ranchon, uh, and how he's trying to, to get the illustrations for it. And he says, I was telephoning, well, I'm a little, doesn't matter. Um, <coughs> I traced the working drawing, but the edges of the sheet are obliterated by the printing mask of the photographer. I call Jardot on the phone, I get a proof without mutilation. All the internal harmony of the work is in the drawings. This has been so since the loftiest and most ancient cultures. It is incredible that artists today should be indifferent, even hostile, to this prime mover, this scaffolding of the project, which is an absolutely wonderful quote. You know, I mean, because you can you can look through the, these kind of idiotic statements that Corbusier makes, completely self-contradictory, all the rest. Uh, 
and then he'll come out with something like that, which is a very odd thing for him to say. But it makes perfect sense, because if you look at the way that these things are developed, they are actually developed through the drawing. It's the drawing that does carry these things, but it carries them like a kind of uh, dormant virus, not as an exposition. That's the way it carries them. Uh, one final <coughs> thing here. I realize that one, let's get back to the modular. Uh, we've seen these various ways in which not only the modular, the fundamental, so to say, geometry of this thing is present in the building, but other kinds as well. And they're all sort of vying with one another in different ways uh, to, 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 to have some sort of presence within it. Um, this, for example, look at this. I mean, I've, I've had uh, students who are always very interested in seeing literal relationships between things because it, it, it gives you a sense of fulfillment. You know? so, we know that he, he, he likes the modular, and he says it's in the building anyway. So, we're, I mean, obviously, this is a modular diagram. So, <laughs> but actually, it's not. One, one thing is just this business of the di direct, the um, generators of the roof structure, which are these here, this, this grid. Uh, the other grid, which you can see underlaying that, uh, which is rectangular, which is, which is shifted, um, is a locational grid. So that, for example, that intersection there, which might look from the distance you are uh, away as defining some correlation on the surface of that wall. It doesn't at all, it's in fact slightly open. Oh, we are the too. Because all it is is just a way of just locating this thing in purely Cartesian terms. Just lay this thing down, and then you make measures this way and that way to locate okay, anything. But the thing doesn't sit on the interstices of the grid in any way. It's just a, it's just a working device. Uh, so we can see that, in fact, Corbusier in practice, is, is, is unbelievably sophisticated about his use of, of, uh, of, of geometry. When it comes to theorizing, he's, um, he's obliteratingly unsophisticated. This is, uh, this is a very, very strange thing about the whole business, um, particularly in relation to the uh, modular. This is thing I was talking about last week, where you see these pages upon pages of uh, modular diagrams, all rectilinear, obviously, in the, in the book. Uh, and this is an illustration of the book. Uh, I realized last week, I didn't say, because uh, of the sort of disorganized way I do almost everything, I didn't actually say uh, what, where the golden section relationship was in this diagram, or how it relates to this Fibonacci series of business, or why the golden section has such a reputation anyway. Uh, and uh, as this kind of coda for this uh, lecture, I just want to start in on that now, because that will lead us conveniently into what uh, I'll start talking about in two weeks' time, uh, which is the earlier history of proportional uh, architecture, uh, and in music, and in perspective. <coughs> well, actually, it's this. You see, uh, if you remember, the, this, is, this is his version of the kind of seat uh, and the thing gets a bit aberrant as we go along here, but this is all perfectly straightforward. Uh, this is a way of generating the golden section. You take your square, uh, you put your line halfway up the square like that, you take the diagonal, which is actually a double square diagonal, it's, it's one square and not one square, uh, and you get your square root of five over four <coughs> dimension there, and then that is transferred by rotation from that point from there down to there, so that's the square root of five over four, and that's a half. And that is actually the, the golden ratio, is the ratio between that full length of the side of the square and that length of the whole system there, up to G. And that is actually a, a, a fairly simple geometric way of constructing the golden ratio, which you express as one plus the square root of five over two. And it's part of the kind of strange properties of this thing. You can also you can also express it as the square root of five minus one over two, and that's also the same ratio. You can just flip the one to a plus or minus, and it still works. Uh, the reason that uh, such a lot of attention was devoted to this thing uh, was was because of um, a specific property that it has as a series. Uh, which is that um, not only does it add together, that is, if, if you, you see this is another golden section. Uh, hang on. Uh, so that 
for example, uh, if you if you add that to that whole system there, you get another length, which is the next term in the series. So that you take the last two terms, add them together, get the third term. So it's like a simple arithmetical thing. You can always you've got two terms, you just add them together and get the next, and you add the last two together and get the next one still, and so on and so forth. Very very simple. Neat little property. Uh, but at the same time, it's a, it's a geometric series. It can be expressed geometrically in that uh, square root of 5 over plus 1 over 2. It's, it's that kind of expression uh, with multiple relationships, not uh, addition of them. Uh, so it combines two characteristics which have always been of tremendous interest since Pythagoras uh, the additive and the, and the, uh, and the geometric that is multiplied. Uh, and that this, this again has, uh, has made it for a long time subject of uh, some scrutiny uh, amongst mathematicians. Actually, not all the time, just twice. Once in the 15th century and once in the 19th. And on both occasions, this thing seems to have had a little kind of art efflorescence. Uh, now, I've also said, the other thing I said last week, which I, I have to take back completely after what I've done in between times, is this. I said that, uh, that Corbusier had been fiddling around with this thing for three or four years to make this system with Mademoiselle Maillard and this man Hanny. Uh, and they'd made, it, but they'd made it like a geometric construction, and actually what they said about it wasn't quite true. That is that when you worked it out ar ar uh, mathematically, uh, it was not precise. And that when he took this thing to René Tatton, and René Tatton, a mathematician, had said, uh, I'm afraid these aren't, this isn't a double square relationship that you end up with here, between there and there, uh, but in fact, um, these are just six thousandths over the, uh, the, the proper amount. Uh, and I used that to deduce that what uh, Hanning and Corbusier and that lot had been doing was fiddling around with compasses and set squares and things on a drawing board to make this thing visually first. Uh, and then afterwards, it had been subject to mathematical scrutiny and it was marginally wrong, it didn't matter. Well, I think that's, I, that's nonsense, actually. The reason it's nonsense is because I went—I I actually worked it out myself in a pocket calculator, which uh, many people didn't have. And it's not six thousand; it's it's uh, it's it's a one and a half percent difference, which is a lot more. What uh, still doesn't sound a lot. Fifteen thousand doesn't sound that terrible. But when you look at it, I did this drawing to see, and uh, actually, it's it's incredibly visible. You know, I mean, this is a double square. And this is the difference between the construction as Corbusier has it and the actual double square. All these dotted lines are what he says is there, but what is this, for example, is the place of a right angle in that system. It should have been there if they were double squares, but it turns out to be there, and it could never have been there, which is where he says it is. And even if, because that isn't a right angle, you see that's a right angle. Not that. So the thing is, is shot through with very, very visible Distances. Given that, uh, I, I have to retract what I said, and I actually don't know now. It's, uh, so it's even more mysterious to me how he, come, he came up with this thing when you could e so easily see that it was wrong, as well as, as, well as calculate that it was. It's, it's very, very strange. <coughs> Nevertheless, so it's slightly uh, a different uh, point now, just to come back to the other things that are in the way that he construed it. Uh, the, 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 if you remember last week, we were talking about the Fibonacci series, which is the series that he relates the golden section to. Uh, and actually, the Fibonacci series is an ever more accurate approximation to the golden section. And all you do is you just, I mean, everybody knows this, I think you start off with one, and then you take any other number, but two is as good as any. So you get one or two together to get three. If you add three and two together, you get five. 3 and 5 to get 8, next term is 13, 21, and so on and so forth. So you just keep adding the last two terms together, and it gets closer and closer towards the golden section. Now, that kind of thing is what Corbusier is doing with his system. He's using that, uh, that um, uh, relationship, which was discovered really in the 19th century. Uh, Fibonacci was a 12th century uh, mathematician, uh, used it as a way of setting up some daft problem about how often rabbits reproduce in a month. 
And uh, if they keep reproducing one pair every month, how long, what, what, what kind of ratio is, does the population increase by each, each time? And it turns out to be the golden section. <laughs> uh, well, actually, no, sorry, it's the Fibonacci series. And then in the 19th century, they, they find out that it's the golden section. Uh, so, but the, 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 other, the other place in which this thing comes into, uh, into prominence in art is through um, uh, Luca Pacioli, who's a 15th century <coughs> mathematician, friend of, of uh, Piero della Francesca, uh, and often quoted in uh, Renaissance studies about the role of geometry and mathematics in art. Uh, and he wrote this thing called uh, the, the Divine Portion, which was about the same ratio. The reason he thought that it was interesting, I, I, I think uh, it's just, I know, it's sort of slightly diverted from uh, the main source of interest here, but the, rate, the reason he found it uh, significant uh, had very little to do with what we might call architectural ideas about, uh, about uh, ratio and proportionality. Uh, he noticed, as indeed uh, plenty of other people had, uh, that if you took a, a five-sided, a regular pentagon, and then you join the diagonal all the diagonals of the pentagon, well, obviously, you get another little pentagon, but well, not so obviously, it doesn't happen with other figures, but you get, uh, you get uh, another little pentagon inside that, and you do it again, and you get another little pentagon inside that, and so on and so on, and you can move it down the line. Uh, well, that's, that's simple, but you see, the, the, the really interesting thing here is, is that. Uh, it just so happens that when you do that on a pentagon, but no other figure has this property, uh, you, it trisects that 108 degree angle. So each of those angles are the same there. They're, they're each the same. Uh, and what that produces is this unbelievable number of, of congruent and similar triangles within this system, all, all overlapping. Uh, and from that, he was able to deduce that the, the ratio of that to that that long side, uh, was going to be the same as the ratio of that to that, which was going to be the same as the ratio of that to that. And that, since those two added up to what we originally started off with, it's just the same principle that we've been looking at in that other thing. You could see how these things were both uh, proportional as a kind of multiple ratio and additive as well. Uh, and by this proliferation of, of similarities within that diagram. It's the same sort of thing. It was why people were so preoccupied with, with some kind of regularity or, or that within a figure, like a sphere or a cube, same kind of thing. Uh, and this was a sp one specific to the, the, the pentagonal figure. Uh, but you can see how difficult that would be to apply to architecture, and it's not very often done. I've lost my uh, side chain. Uh -huh. Oh, no, it wasn't that I was looking for. I looked at my slide changer. It's that I've lost. I don't know what I've done with it. I can't even see the lead that comes up to it. Oh, of course, there isn't one, is there? It's that. Brain doctor. You get to the truth in the end. Don't you? <laughs> um, just one final observation about this thing. So we have the, these these various kinds of ingredients here, uh, which is made somehow relatively effective use of that the idea of taking the Fibonacci series, relating it to the golden section, putting the geometrical construction, and then this uh, arithmetical one side by side is clearly in Corbusier's mind and construction of the modular system. Um, what also is interesting, I think, is, is that uh, during the 19th century, prior to that, most ideas of architectural proportion had registered the musical connection and whole number ratios, one to two, two to three, three to four, that kind of thing. Uh, and what happens in the 19th century, as many people have pointed out, is it goes across to the irrationals, like the square root of two over one to one or whatever in these close uh, irrational ratios, uh, which are easier to construct geometrically than they are to, uh, to calculate, uh, and which show these kind of uh, correspondences of angle, proportional correspondences, between lots of things within a facade. 
Uh, so this wonderful little document here, which is one of these balmy things, according to show how the golden section is is just rampant in the uh, in the bathroom. This by somebody called D. R. Hay, it was produced in 1853. Uh, it's called The Orthographic Beauty of the Parthenon. Two things are really marked it out, which make it, in, in my mind, by far the most interesting of these kinds of inquiry, most of which are incredibly dark, uh, and rather like Corbusier. Not only in the sense that he's taken up this idea of, of, of uh, the right angle within the system of, of ratios, which you can see quite clearly here, um, but also that uh, he, he sees, he recognizes it as, ha as having something to do with the drawing. Those ratios and their, their application are in the drawing, the orthographic projection of this system. More than they are in the thing itself. They're more visible in the drawing than in the thing. He recognizes that. That's why it's called the orthographic beauty of the Parthenon, even though the Parthenon is quite kind of bodily non-orthographic object. Um, the other thing he recognizes is, uh, well, not doesn't recognize, but sort of insinuates, is, is this. Uh, when he does the details of these things, he takes all these all these wonderful figures, not you know segments of circles and that kind of thing, but all these wonderful figures like hyperbole and ellipses. Quite, I mean, he, he just says uh, that the sections of, of um, a col I think this is up to the wrong way. It's a column base, I think. No, it isn't. It's capital. Uh, and that they're they're derived from these kind of curves, not those old-fashioned silly bits of circles and things. Uh, which again relates back to the business of uh, what is happening at that particular time, the development of uh, descriptive geometry, because these kinds of things are always being dealt with in descriptive geometry, but not in architecture. Much. So he's importing them over here and saying, look, they're in this, this old building. <coughs> so in uh, those respects, it's, it's something like what Courbusier had in, in mind. Uh, but it was during that 19th century period that there was this re- birth of interest in the, in the golden section uh, and its direct application to matters of art, which hadn't happened in the 15th century. Uh, actually, that never happened then at all. Uh, which suggests some change in, in the idea of, of, uh, of the system of proportion. These, you can see from this very strange diagram, again, just coming back to this point, that Corbusier was very, very inclined I mean, I think that uh, as I look at this thing, and I, I look at what he was doing in the modular, and I compare it to what he was actually doing in the building, and it, I, I, I have no way of explaining the absurdity of, of what he comes up with here, as, as, as if he was deliberately, he was deliberately mucking the thing up. Maybe he really did know that it didn't add up to two squares, but he just liked the idea of having kind of destroyed it a bit in there. Because you could draw something freehand, like all those things in the poem of the rectangle, which are all freehand drawings, um, you could convey the idea without it actually being the same sort of shape, almost as if he had a kind of destructive impulse toward the thing itself. He certainly made very little attempt to get to grips with, with why it was the way it was, although he spent a lot of time propagating it as a kind of propaganda exercise, uh, which is very, very strange. Uh, these angles, for example, are the, uh, the angles of the Pentagon star, but they, uh, they relate hardly at all to anything else that's going on in the diagram. <laughs> so uh, we, we end up then with this uh, with, with very strange, and to my mind, I mean, incomplete story. I mean, I don't have a full grasp of it, I know myself. Uh, all I can present to you at the moment is the idea that, yes, there is this recurring notion uh, of a fundamental geometry which underlies architecture. What Corbusier actually has in this building is the, the proposition that he has this underlying geometry in the modular. He then illustrates that rather, rather diffidently in the building, these odd little, you know, the, the arrangement of the, the fenestration on that facade, perhaps the door and the paving, and that's it. That's the funny person there. But the geometry which does seem much more embedded in the thing is these geometries of, of the development of surfaces through straight lines, curved surfaces through straight lines, which is a thing which occurs through all that work in the 50s. And the, uh, the idea of using descriptive geometrical techniques in order to describe very strange shapes. They're the ones that are kind of, in some ways, more deeply embedded in the object. They're not, they're not fundamental they're part of a sort of transmissive procedure.
from an idea to a thing, but they're really powerfully there. Now, the real the question then arises as to which is more powerfully present and why on earth he went to such efforts to establish that the modular was present in this thing. And I think it goes back to an idea which has struck me before about what people can say and what they can do. That if you find it very difficult to say something about what you've done, you sometimes have to make some kind of almost like allegorical statement in order to try and, and correspond somehow with what you think you've done. So Corbusier's ideas of order, which I'm sure are really profoundly present in all that work, he can't write about, it's too difficult to write about all the ways in which it's actually there. So this thing will stand for it, almost like a kind of ensign for something which he believes to be present but can't articulate in his own work. But its actual presence is, is, uh, is, is, is not at all easy to discern, not as a, as, um, a, a governing thing, anyway. Uh, finally, I just want to, this is just a, a, a connection to what I want to start out with a uh, week after next, uh, which is that um, I, I want to go back to the idea of this, I, this constitution of a fundamental geometry for architecture. Uh, in order to look at that, I want to go back to the 15th century again. But what I'd like to do is this. This is a, this is a diagram also from the modular where Corbusier has this bright idea, another kind of bright idea about the modular, that it relates to the way we see, which you can see in that thing there, uh, those kind of measures, uh, as opposed to the way uh, of, of simple kind of equal, sort of uh, stupid metric system of just uh, multiplying meter upon meter and subdivisions, uh, which gives you this sort of grid form, but we actually see things like that. He says. Now it's not much of an argument actually, and it's not true anyway. But, <laughs> but that doesn't matter. It's an idea about a kind of something. It's more like that than it is. It is more like with a kind of spectacular relationship than it is about equal relationships in a grid. Uh, so you can see that he's kind of again in a sort of metaphorical way making a perfectly plausible statement. But by trying to, as it were, say that it is true, he's tripping over himself. Um, but the interesting thing here is that there are two things that Corbusier, he deals with this relationship to component vision as one kind of justification. He starts off the book with a thing about music and how music has a system of order and organization. What I'd like to do in relation to the 15th century, when each of these things is supposedly got into its, its, its most perfect and consonant form, I want to look at each of the three of them and see what was actually going on. If you put music, and perspective and architecture during that 15th century period. Maybe you say something, you actually find that the situation is quite coherent, but not at all what it's normally purported to be, and that's what I'd like to come back to then. Thanks.